Ben, it's a pleasure to uh, talk. And um, you've had a hard week of serious, hard science where you have to think a lot and pay attention. But now we can offer you a little more relaxed talk. And hopefully some of you will be interested in how our wonderful field developed. And specifically, I'm going to talk about Gregorio Weber, the famous Argentinian um, who did so much, basically the, the father of all modern fluorescence, I would say. So, um, okay, first of all, though, I must comment on uh, Happy Thanksgiving for those of us in the States. And due to rather strange historical reasons, these lectures always seem to take place on Thanksgiving. So later in the day, I'll be enjoying some turkey, uh, which I'm not sure exists even in Uruguay, but that's another story. So uh, uh, happy Thanksgiving to those of us, those of you who celebrate it. Okay, so when was it first observed what we now recognize as fluorescence? Well, Nicholas Monardis, Spanish physician and botanist wrote basically translated and, and studied the, the reports from the conquistadors in the New World in the 1500s. And he's credited to be the first to describe the bluish opalescence of water infusion from wood of a small Mexican tree. And uh, people would make this into cups filled with water and they'd see this blue tinge. Um, actually, let me show that again, it's very nice. Bernardino de Sargun was a Franciscan missionary who actually was there in the New World and he independently described the wood called Coatli by the Aztecs. And uh, in the original translation, they said it makes the uh, water a blue color and is uh, medicinal, medicinal for basically um, urine issues. So I'm indebted, by the way, Ulysses Acuna, our, we'll mention him again in a minute, who did a big study of those original documents in, in Madrid. Ulysses is in Madrid and studied the original documents. So an early um, uh, famous Belgium, Charles de Lecluse, gave the name lignum nephriticum kidney wood, which helped extend awareness of the strange optical properties throughout Europe. And it became very popular in this. 16th, 17th century Europe because of the medicinal virtues for treating kidney ailments. Now, this attracted the attention of many pr prominent scientists, including Isaac Newton and Robert Boyle. And uh, Boyle really looked at this more carefully. He discovered that after many infusions, the wood lost the power to give color to the water and concluded there was some essential salt in the wood responsible for this effect, which is very insightful. But he also discovered that addition of acid abolished the color and addition of alkali brought it back. And this is uh, actual taken from the original Boyle manuscript. I thank Katie Reinhardt for providing the 1670 manuscript to me. And you can see that he um, talked about addition of uh, a little spirit of vinegar, which would lower the pH that the, the color immediately vanished. But then he would add a few drops of oil of tartar del deliquium, which it took me a while to figure out that's potassium carbonate, which would raise the pH, that color was immediately restored. Well, actually he was the first to use fluorescence as a pH indicator, and he really did. In other experiments, he'd use this to describe if things were getting, now we would say more alkaline or more acid, so it's amazing in 1670, Boyle was using fluorescence as a pH indicator. So the actual structure of, uh, of the chromophore in Linda Mephriticum was not established until 2009 with the work of Ulysses Acuna and his group. And they show this, it's known that it's an alkaline solution that this forms, that there's a very complex rearrangement of the underlying molecule called cotylin into metylin to get this uh, finally this uh, this uh, this the molecule that actually is the, provides the color and there you can see up here that it's a very high quantity of one in a lifetime of 2.78 um, which makes me think Lee now sometime we should go and do some flim studies on this but that's another story so 
And this is what you see. You can see I dropped a piece of lignum refriticum into this beaker with alkaline solution and it instantly lit up. It's just spectacular. The first time I saw it, I was knocked off my feet in a dark lab with a hand lap. Wow, it's just spectacular. So it's worth to, uh, to see that sometime. In more recent years, other people have demonstrated that other wood samples, like one type of sycamore tree gives uh, these colors too. It's a different chromophore though, uh, scopolatin, but it also gives this very nice bluish uh, fluorescence. So maybe we'll find more as time goes on. But I wanna deviate a little bit from fluorescence to talk about an observation on phosphorescence made by Galileo in 1612. And it's really remarkable, I think, because there was already in the early 1600s, there was this famous Bologna stone, it was called, which was um, barium sulfate uh, containing stone, which a Bologna shoemaker discovered. And when he put it in the sunlight, then he would take it into his house at night and it would glow. And this was phosphorescence. But what attracted me to Galileo's comments, and I actually remember going with Enrico Gratton on the campus of University of Illinois to their wonderful, wonderful library, which was fantastic, finding the original documents uh, and looking at that. And Galileo wrote, it must be explained how it happens that the light is conceived into the stone and is given back after some time as in childbirth. So in 1612, he recognized that somehow light's going in and causing something that it gives back the light after some time, after, in this case, the phosphorescent lifetime. But it's remarkable how clever these early scientists were. Now, going more modern times, David Brewster was the first to describe that if you have an uh, alcohol solution of leaves and pass white light, you can see red light from the side. Of course, this was chlorophyll fluorescence. And I know some of you are interested in plants and it's very important in studies in plant house and health and photosynthesis. Portable fluorescence instruments are routinely taken out in the field. But not only that, but sometimes measurements for measuring chlorophyll are taken out of the world. And there's satellite chlorophyll fluorescence measurements all around the planet. And you can see this sort of color rendering where we have the more reddish and yellowish uh, um, uh, colors is where they have denser, uh, like here's the Amazon rainforest and parts of Africa. And you can use this from satellites to monitor uh, plants development and health around the world. So Brewster's work eventually led to this. Um, one of the more important people in our field though was John Herschel. And, he was really an amazing person. He was a mathematician, astronomer, chemist, experimental photographer. And there's a picture he took of himself in 1867. And he named the seven moons of Saturn and four of the moons of Uranus, which was discovered by his father, Sir William Herschel. And he also translated the Iliad of Homer and invented blueprints. So uh, he puts most of us to shame with his wide range of talents. But in 1845, he made the first observation of fluorescence from quinine sulfate. And he termed this phenomena epipolic dispersion. And this is his actual paper where he talks on the case of superficial color pre presented by a homogeneous liquid internally colorless. And he described this as an extremely vivid and beautiful celestial blue color. They wrote in such wonderful language back then. And Let's think about quinine for a moment. I think it's perhaps the most important molecule in the development of the fluorescence field. As you'll see it, it was the driving force between uh, so many uh, important contributions. Well, quinine is a bitter compound that comes from the, the bark of the chinchona tree, most commonly found in South America, Central America, the Caribbean and Western coast of Africa. Already by 1650, shipments of chinchona bark were sent regularly to Spain from its colonies because they recognized from the, 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 the natives in the, the colonies, the, the native people already knew to use this for treatment of malaria. So this became the malaria treatment for hundreds of years. 
For more than 300 years, these trees were the only source of quinine. And we'll see that efforts to synthesize quinine ultimately led to the development of the dye industry and the synthesis of many important fluorescent molecules. Now, I've been told by Enrico that many bars have UV illumination that permit one to observe the color from a gin and tonic. Naturally, I have no personal knowledge of this. All right, I have a little bit. But in fact, if you take a gin and tonic or tonic water and with a hand lamp, you can see this beautiful color. And I actually have seen it in bars if you, some of them have UV lights. But it's interesting that the gin and tonic cocktail was introduced by the British East India Company in India. Because in tropical region, regions, malaria was a persistent problem. And in the 1700s, a Scottish doctor studied how quinine, traditional cure for malaria, could be used to prevent it. So quinine was drunk in tonic water, but the bitter taste was unpleasant. So British officers in India, already by the early 19th century, took to adding a mixture of water, sugar, lime, and gin to the tonic to make the drink more palatable. And thus the gin and tonic was born. But certainly, I think George Gabriel Stokes must be considered the father of, uh, of uh, fluorescence. And partly because of this paper right here, he had this wonderful 100 page paper um, on, which he, on the change of refrangibility of light. And it's just marvelous to read. And he immediately in the beginning talks about Herschel's work and the um, beautiful celestial blue color. So that's what inspired him. And he studied this with any number of light sources. He would do it by sunlight, by candlelight, even when out during lightning storms to see if lightning, the light from lightning could, could engender this, this phenomena. And um, in the original work, he used the term dispersive reflection to describe the phenomena because that's what people were calling it then. Fortunately for all of us today, he then wrote a footnote, and this is taken directly from his article. I confess I do not like this term. I'm almost inclined to coin a word and call the appearance fluorescence from fluorspar, as the analogous term opalescence is derived from the name of a mineral. So if not for, if not for Stokes, you would be attending this uh, workshop on dispersive reflection microscopy, so we can all be happy that he renamed it. And also in his wonderful paper, um, he made all kinds of magnificent observations. One of the most important ones was this. He used a prism to disperse solar spectrum and illuminated a solution of quinine. And he noted there was no effect until the quinine was placed in the ultraviolet region. So below where you could see, and then he would see this fluorescence. And he wrote this, which is again, wonderful the way they wrote. It was certainly a curious sight to see the tube instantaneously lighted up when plunged into the invisible rays. It was literally darkness visible. Altogether, the phenomena had something of an unearthly appearance. This observation led Stokes to proclaim the fluorescences of longer wavelength than the exciting light, which led to this displacement being called the Stokes shift. So already this was in 1852. Now, a very important thing happened a bit later on in the 1800s when uh, we'll see. So, well, William Henry Perkin um, made the following observations. So this is a picture of him. He took it himself at 14. Again, they had a lot of amateur photographers when this first started. And at the age of 18, he started with the idea of making quinine by oxidizing allyl toluidine. So he was working for uh, a chemist. And of course, there was a great interest, as I've said, to make quinine because the British really wanted to be able to produce quinine for their, um, their people scattered all over the world. And he accidentally made the synthetic dye mauve, which was a derivative of coal tar with an aluminum base. Fortunately for him, Queen Victoria loved the color. Here you see him holding up a, a cloth dyed with mauve, sort of a purplish color. And Perkins started a company to produce dyes and next produced a green and violet. And they say that the canal outside his factory turned a different color every week. Obviously this is before environmental protection agencies. 
and others had synthesized synthetic dyes, but he was the first to recognize the potential for commercialization and really started the synthetic dye industry, which was in England for a while until several German chemists studying with him took it back to Germany, um, which had better patent laws, let's say. And that's why the, the next big dye industry was in Germany. But it started with Perkin. Histologists started to use dyes to stain samples within a decade of his discovery. Well, in 1871, a German chemist, Adolf von Bayer, synthesized this compound. And I don't have to tell you what that is. Well, maybe I do. Fluorescein. So in 1871, he made fluorescein. And this was his paper. And why did he call it fluorescein? It took me a long while going through the, <laughs> the German literature to find it. Apparently coined the name fluorescein from flo, which was from the term fluorescence from Stokes, and racine, which was resorcinol, okay? And because he reacted resorcinol with phthalic anhydride to make fluorescein. So the name fluorescein is telling you the synthetic route, how he made fluorescein. And in 1905, he got a Nobel Prize in chemistry for all of his achievements in organic chemistry um, and for the chemical industry, because he really helped start uh, the German chemical dye industry. And already in 1877, uh, there was a major groundwater tracing experiment using fluorescein, and with NOP did this, and they put 10 kilograms of fluorescein added to the Danube River. And here we say on Tuesday, October 9th, at four o'clock in the evening. And they looked to see in the spring uh, on the other side of these mountains what would happen and they found that the water, uh, it would come out and basically 60 hours later, and these results showed that the Danube and Rhine rivers were connected by underground streams. And this was one of the first um, um, water tracing experiments. Now they still use maybe more rhodamine, but they use other, other dyes, but it's a very important for people trying to trace water that disappears underground. Now, you might think 10 kilograms, that's a lot. I mean, you wouldn't do that today. Well, not true. Every year on St. Patrick's Day, the Chicago River is dyed green with about 40 pounds of fluorescein. Actually, in the last few years, they've changed from fluorescein to a different dye, which they won't tell you what it is, but it's a fluorescein type dye. So here's the opposite now I want to show you of a single molecule experiment. And you can see the fluorescein being thrown out the back of the boat. And this happens every year at the Chicago River. It's really magnificent. So if you're ever in Chicago near St. Patrick's Day, you have to look at it. Well, in 1887, a nitrogen analog of fluorescein Rhodamine was made, described by Maurice Sarasol, and he worked, um, he actually studied with Heinrich Caro, who had worked with von Bayer, and Caro was Sarasol's boss, and he made a lot of rhodamine dyes working for the, uh, the big company BASF, and these were basic dyes red in color, brilliantly fluorescent, so he called them rhodamines from the Greek rhodon, meaning rose and amines, because they were basic. And we had a series of rhodamine dyes that we still use today, rhodamine B, rhodamine 6G, rhodamine 3G. So he was the, uh, the man behind the, the modern rhodamine compounds. And there's a beautiful series of papers I want to point it out by this guy or woman, I think, Cooksey, who had quirks of dyed nomenclatures. And you can find a lot of things, and it's fascinating to read some of these papers. Well, then in the, Paul Ehrlich in 1882 used uranin, the sodium salt of fluorescein, to track secretions of the aqueous humor in the eye. First in vivo use, use of fluorescence. And many, I'm sure all of you have done this at the eye doctors, where they put this drop in your eye and you, then they shine a blue laser and you can see some green light. That's sodium fluorescein you're looking at. Uh, it was called uranin because of the intense green color, reminiscent of the color of uranium glass. 
Nowak in 1887 published a book listing 660 compounds arranged according to the color of their fluorescence, the early example of a molecular probes catalog. And Mayer used the term fluorophore for the first time to describe chemical groups associated with fluorescence. And Helmstead and Lehman independently developed the first fluorescent microscopes as an outgrowth of the UV microscope. So fluorescent microscopes have been around since the more than 100 years. And I think one of the heroes of this early work was Stanislav von Provizek, who in 1914 first described using fluorescent microscopy to study dye binding. And he was studying um, um, cholera, and he died in that year of cholera at a, at a fairly young age. And the infectious agent of typhus uh, is named after him and Howard Rickus. Uh, and then Albert Kuhn's is interesting. He was the first to label antibodies with fluorescein isocyanate, which gave birth to the field of immunofluorescence. But I want to distinguish that isocyanate. It was only in 58 that Riggs et al. described fluorescein isothiocyanate, which is by far the most popular probe used, which they made this to circumvent inherent difficulties with the isocyanate derivative, okay? So that's where FITC started. But then we get to Gregorio Weber, who we'll talk about in much more detail a little later in this talk. And in 52, he, he synthesized and attached danzo chloride, the proteins, and initiated the study of quantitative biological fluorescence. And the other important, another important field for all of you, I already mentioned previously, Shimomura, who discovered the green fluorescent protein. Now, one of the major factors in increasing interest in fluorescence was the company started by Richard and Rosaria Hauglin in their kitchen in Minnesota. I remember when they first did this, molecular probes. And for a brief time, they were in Plano, Texas. Because up until that time, you, you had to synthesize probes yourself. I myself would have to synthesize probes and build the instruments and also walk through the snow in Urbana, Illinois. But that's another story. So their first probe was Texas Red. Interestingly, in the 1980s, they moved to Oregon. And in 2003, molecular probes was bought by Invitrogen for $325 million. So yes, some people did get rich on fluorescence. Certainly not anybody I know, not Gregorio Weber, but uh, commercialization paid off. But they did some wonderful works. And one of the things, I mentioned this before, was they made the Alexa dries to have a very bright, stable, photostable compounds. And this really allowed a lot of uh, fluorescent microscopy work to, to develop, thanks to these, which were named after their son, Alex Hoagland, Alexa dyes. And I already showed this about photo bleaching. Photo bleaching. And I also mentioned the new modern uh, dyes coming from uh, Luke Lavis and others. Genelia, you see a lot of people using Genelia dyes. Okay, let's go back to basic fluorescence then. Let's talk a bit about polarization. Now, polarizers have been in use for a very long time. The Vikings used this, what they called a sunstone, which was thought to be um, calcite, a natural polarizer material, because up in the northern climate, you, had, you couldn't see the sun on overcast days, which happened a lot. But they didn't know the basis of it, but they knew this sunstone, you could look around the sky and rotate it, and scattered light is highly polarized. So you would be different if you're looking away from the sun than at the sun. So basically, they would use this to navigate around and do all the, um, the terrible things that Viking are known to do, but also navigate and, and explore, which was good. And it was Etienne Louis Melu in 1808 observed sunlight reflected from the windows of the Luxembourg Palace in Paris, looking through a calcite crystal. And he discovered that the intensity of the reflected light varied as he rotated the crystal. And he's the one who coined the term polarized to describe this property of light. And he published his results in 1809 on the property of uh, reflected light. And he also interestingly derived an expression for calculating transmission as a function of the angle between two polarizers. So we'd hold you know, two of them up and rotate one relative to the other. 
and he has the value of law not written as intensity and the angle is equal to intensity of the zero angle cosine squared. So he recognized there was a cosine square law at work here. Now, David Brewster studied the relationship between the refractive index and the angle of incident on reflected light. So he picked up some years later after that original work. Um, well, he did this original work in 1830. He discovered that for normal glass and visible light, the incident angle of 56 degrees resulted in total reflection. This angle is now known as Brewster's angle. And he it allowed him to make a constructive polarizer composed of a, a pile of plates. You could put, put it in different ray, ways to, in the second way here, you can ensure that the light would be going along the same collinear with the incident thing. And these were used for many years. In fact, if you look at the PhD thesis of Gregorio Weber, he used a pile of plate polarizer. And I remember when I joined the lab and Enrico joined the lab, he showed us his pile of plates polarizer. And I'm sorry to say that it somehow got lost because it would be wonderful to have that original pile of plates polarizer that he utilized. Uh, nickel, though, made an important advance in 1828 and found that when you cut Iceland spar at a certain two crystals at an angle of 68 degrees and put them together with Canadian balsam to attach them, you could have a very nice polarizer and one plane, the unwanted plane, would be rejected to the side, which usually have it coated in a black coating. Uh, so that was useful. And then many other ones were developed, Glenn Foucault, Glenn Thompson, Glenn Taylor's. The Glenn Taylor's had an air gap, so you could really go lower in the UV because the Canadian balsam could absorb the UV light. But the Henry Ford of polarizers, that is the person who brought it to the masses, was Edwin uh, land. And when he was an undergraduate at Harvard in the 20s, he discovered that you could make these crystals of, um, of iodoquinine sulfate embedded in nitrocellulose, and by pulling and stretching it, you could develop polarizers. And he made his, his H sheet became famous because it was a very, you see him holding up this H sheet here, very cheap and readily available polarizers, which allowed many people to start using them for various, various projects. Now, I want to mention a very important paper connected with polarization and energy transfer between identical fluorophores. So this is HOMO transfer by Gaviola, who we'll talk about more in a minute, and Pringsheim, his advisor in 1924. And this was an important paper because they found out if you take urine and again the sodium salt of fluorescein and dissolve it in, in glycerin, water-free glycerin, and they would get something like 100 milligrams per mil. How they got this dissolved, I can't imagine. And then you start looking at the polarization and you dilute this thing one over four times, you zero polarization. And remember, this is glycerin, so the molecules are not rotating. You'd expect it to be highly polarized. And then the one over eight, they probably dropped it. Okay, one over 16. And this is in what we now would call centipole. So it's 0 0.03 polarization. And as you dilute and dilute and dilute, the polarization goes up and up till you get to something like about at about one over 20,000, 20, you get 0.45. So this was very important because they see that as you dilute it, and they knew that meant the molecules were getting farther apart you no longer would have this effect. And in fact, even then people started to realize this is what gave a big push to theories of fluorescence resin of Forster. Well, this was before Forster of energy transfer, let's say, um, because people recognized there must be something about the proximity of the, of the fluorescenes that gave this effect. And that helped develop the whole field. We'll talk about that later. But that brings us to Francis Perrin, the son of the famous physicist Jean Perrin, who got a Nobel Prize for his work on um, making it clear that atoms exist. And Jean Perrin also was famous for his work on translational diffusion. So it's interesting that his son Francis Perrin talked about rotational diffusion. Um, and already in the 20s, when he was quite young, Perrin published several important papers on a quantitative theory of fluorescence polarization, including his classic paper in 26 um, that we still use to this day. And that's 
his first, what we now call the Perrin equation in there, okay? And polarization remained largely in the province of physicists for two decades until Gregorio Weber began his thesis to work in Cambridge. And we'll talk about that later. Now, what about the time interval between absorption and emission of light? Already in Stokes's paper, he said, he, he wondered if there was a time between absorption and emission, no doubt thinking of Gaviola's work on phosphorescence, on phosphorescence or what's, what's now known as phosphorescence. But, um, and it's funny because Stokes actually said in his paper, he's thinking of making a system of rotating mirrors to look at that. And it's a good thing he never did it because you would have to rotate awfully, awfully fast. But the first time we had any understanding of the magnitude of the time interval was this wonderful paper by R.W. Wood, famous American physicist in, in 1921. And in this paper, he describes experiments he did collaboration with Mendenhall and University of Wisconsin. And what they did is they got a high pressure pump and they would get a jet of solution of fluorescent molecules going, shooting out at 200 meters per second. And they used different ones, anthracene, for example. But what they did is at the very end, they had it blackened and they had a little, the very end of the nozzle, they, they removed the paint and had some sunlight going in, or not sunlight, but light going in. Okay, and the idea was then, they had no idea if they went fast, they should observe a fluorescent trail that depends on how long the lifetime was, which is very clever when you think about it. But they didn't see anything, even though they could measure 0.1 millimeters and that meant that their duration of the fluorescence was less than one over 2.3 mil, 2 millionths of a second, which is less than 435 nanoseconds. So although they didn't get down short enough, this put an order of magnitude on what the lifetime of the fluorescence was. And actually, interestingly, in 2013, these people using uh, the delayed fluorescence of europium and terbium chelates did this experiment where they had flow going through a microchip, they would excite at the edge and they would look at the, the distance, how, how the fluorescence uh, went off with time. And these are microseconds fluorescence decays in this delay, this uh, special type of fluorescence. So they actually, they actually did uh, his experiment in more modern times. But the real person who made the first serious fluorescence lifetime measurements was Enrique Gaviola. And in this paper in 1927, he describes what he called a fluorometer. Now that brings us back. Early in my first lecture on the first day, I mentioned the difference between, between a fluorometer and a fluorimeter. And this is the difference, as Gregory Weber explained to me, because he called it a fluorometer with an O for lifetimes, anytime you're talking about a lifetime measurement, you should say you're doing with a fluorometer. With spectro, you're doing a fluorimeter. Okay. And Gaviola was really one of the most outstanding scientists produced by Argentina. And he was born in Mendoza. But it's interesting, he went to German, uh, Germany to study at Geningen. And his list of professors he, he dealt with was Frank, Herbert, Born, Planck, um, Einstein, Nernst, I mean, that's, that's a bunch of professors and his committee was co-directed by Nernst and von Lau. So you think you have a tough committee. It's not as tough as, uh, as Gaviola's. And uh, interestingly, um, Enrico Gratton's father um, actually worked with Enrico Fermi. That's why Enrico Gratton is named Enrico. And he, he knew Gaviola and he was in Argentina when Gaviola was, and he had a lot of interesting stories about his time with Gaviola, but we can't go into them now. But Gaviola did essentially phase fluorometry and he, he didn't have detectors, he used the eye and he would change the length of the path lengths to look at interference patterns. And he got the lifetime of sodium fluorescein four and a half, just a touch high, but rhodamine B, two nanoseconds exactly on what you'd get today. So he gave the first accurate lifetime measurements using phase fluorometry in 1927. And I mentioned this before that the first microscope using lifetimes was made in 59 by um, um, Veneta, 
Uh, and he talks about there how he built it up from parts from a TV set. That's also interesting. So I want to talk about fret now. This appeared in a 2006 book that said that a German scientist discovered pro close proximity of two chlor chromophores changes their spectral properties in predictable ways. That's not correct. Forster, as we'll see, did important work, but he didn't discover this. Let's look at the milestones. Already in 1922, Cario and Frank demonstrated that if you have a mixture of mercury and thallium atomic vapors and you excited 254, which was the mercury resonance line, you could see thallium emission at 535. And it's told people that somehow you're transferring the energy from the mercury atomic vapor or atoms to the thallium. And then Gaviola and Pringsheim, I've mentioned in 1924, observed concentration dependence of polarization. And this inspired other people, first with the Perens. Jean Perrin proposed the mechanism of energy transfer, and Kalman in London developed a quantum theory. And this R0 term was used for the first time in their paper. That's what we now call the Forster distance, but that was first done by Kalman in London. In 32, Francis Perrin developed, published a quantum mechanical theory of energy transfer, but he gave a qualitative, not a quantitative discussion of the effect of spectral overlap. And it was Tate Forster developed the final complete quantitative theory. So yes, Forster did important work, but you see he, he built upon this work that was developed over, um, over more than two decades. Now, what about commercial spectrofluorimeters. Certainly when, uh, as we're talking about Gregorio Weber was starting, and even when I was in his lab, we all had, we had home-built instruments. But commercial instruments arose because of the anti-malarial research of the 1940s. The United States government during World War II issued a call to scientists and doctors to develop better treatment because there was a shortage in quinine. Again, quinine. Several researchers, the NIH tried to do we're trying to develop fluorescent assays, but they didn't have good instrumentation. So Robert Bowman at the NIH in the Laboratory of Technical Development developed the flexible instrument. This led to the first commercial instrument, the famous Amico Bowman. And some of you may have seen these, certainly any older person like myself, we remember these, and Ferrand also, but mainly the Amico Bowman was famous and was, was in, in use uh, for many, many years, and you see dials just change the excitation and the emission wavelength. But this became a, in all labs doing fluorescence had this. Now in 1956, it cost about $8,000, but in 1921 or 22 dollars, that's $80,000. So it was very, very expensive to acquire one of these. So let's look at fluorescence in the 20th century. Most of the basic principles were developed in the 20s and 30s. Excited State Lifetime, Gaviola, Quantum U, Vevilov, Polarization by Weiger first observed and Perens, and Energy Transfer, the Perens, Tate Forster, and others. But until the second half of the 20th century, the use of fluorescence in biology and biochemistry was descriptive in nature, primarily limited to a role in isolation, purification, quantification of fluorescent substances, such as riboflavin and porphyrins. True quantitative biological fluorescence began, began with the pioneering work of Gregorio Weber. So um, now we, as I've said, it's become highly specialized technique and many people contributed, but one individual, Gregorio Weber, can be singled out for outstanding and far reaching contributions. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But I first have to comment here whenever I look at this slide, I also think of another very prominent scientist, Argentinian, Luis Vega Tolli. And that's because I first started making these slides uh, when I was visiting the Laboratory for Fluorescence Dynamics 20 years ago when Louise was a postdoc there. And I had no knowledge of how to do a PowerPoint. And Louise taught me, and this is the first slide he helped me make. So I cannot look at that without thinking fondly of Louise Vega Tolli. Um, so another great Argentinian. And let's look at a biological sketch of Weber. He was born in Buenos Aires in Argentina on July 4th. And even today in the US on July 4th, we set off fireworks to celebrate uh, his birthday. And here he is a picture I got of Weber was one year old from Pancho Barantes provided this. He got an MD degree in 43 
was a teaching assistant with Bernardo Jose, who many of you know, he was the first South or Latin American to be awarded a Nobel Prize for his work on the pituitary, pituitary hormones. And then he attended Cambridge University on a, a British Council Fellowship with thesis advisors of Malcolm Dixon. We'll talk more in a minute. He got his PhD in 47, independent investigator in Cambridge until 52, joined Sheffield University, and then in 62 joined the biochemistry department at the University of Illinois, where he um, uh, stayed the rest of his life. Now, at the University of Buenos Aires, Bernardo Jose suggested that Weber apply for a prestigious British Council Fellowship. And I looked those up. They were very rare. You get one or two a year. And this was support travel to go and work in Cambridge. So Gregory Weber uh, left in 1943 England to go. And it took 44 days in a convoy during World War II he said that because in, every time he told me the story, I swear there were more and more U-boat attacks. So I don't know how many there were, but he went on this trip. And if you look closely, you might even see the U-boat. No, oh, there it was. Okay. And he got after 44 days to England. And in Cambridge, he entered St. John's College where he met Malcolm Dixon. At that time, Dixon was one of the best known enzymologists in the world and also one of the premier biophysicists. And Dixon suggested that he apply uh, techniques to the of physical chemistry to study proteins. Now, at that time, Dixon was already acknowledged as one of the world's premier physical biochemists, and he recorded the first absorption spectrum of cytochrome C. So you begin to see how Gregory Weber got his interest going in applying spectroscopy to proteins. And at the time, Weber told me he knew little about fluorescence, but he learned there were a number of low molecular weight flavin compounds, like riboflavin, FAD, that differed greatly in fluorescence intensity. And he was given this task of sorting out this area, and he continued to sort it out the rest of his life. This is the thesis in 47, which was on flu uh, fluorescence of riboflavin, diaphorase, a flavin binding protein and related substances. And here he is graduating in 1947 from St. John's College in Cambridge. Now, his first paper um, was devoted to quenching of fluorescence. Okay, and here's a picture. And boy, the publication rate wasn't as rapid then. He submitted it in 1946, revised in 47. It was published in 48. So obviously, we're a little impatient nowadays for that. But in this paper, he described quenching by complex formation. They knew quenching, dynamic quenching by collision. Nobody had described um, complex formation. And to do this, to demonstrate complex formation, he had to measure some measure of the lifetime. They didn't have lifetime machines. And the idea was that um, if you have collisional quenching, you will change the lifetime. But if you have complex formation, something binds to the floor for it, it prevents it from being excited you will not change the lifetime because any molecule that's excited is free and you'll have the same lifetime. But he used his knowledge of polarization to study the polarization. And you see here, this is from his, his actual handwriting here and this preprint I got from him. You see the quenching, looking at quenching relative to the intensity of iodide quenching and the polarization changes and changes, namely gets higher and higher as you get a shorter lifetime. But in the beginning with hydroquinone, you quenched the intensity, but you didn't change the lifetime until you got the very high concentration. So that led to the idea of static quenching of fluorescence. Now, I want to mention his early work in FAD and NADH, because you've heard so much in this workshop about autofluorescence. And I recommend anybody working in this area to look at some of the original papers by Gregorio Weber. This was his first one in 1950. This gave the first demonstration of internal complexes of FAD. And this is 1957, his first work on the NADH, which was called dihydrodiphosphopyridinucleotide then. And in this early paper in 1958 in the French journal, Journal Chemie Physique, he also, and I thought this was interesting, he calculated the lifetime of NADH using uh, at that time, early equations by Forster on um, oscillator strength. 
and he calculated a lifetime for free NADH of 0.35 nanoseconds, which I think is interesting because that's pretty close to what it actually is, and everybody uses this today. Over the next two decades, he published a lot of articles on NADH or FAD, and really, you can see that he really started the entire field of NADH and FAD fluorescence, which I think people forget about, but they're wonderful papers. I've read many of them myself. Um, now in 69, he did the first accurate direct measurement of NADH lifetime with his postdoc, Richard Spencer. They made a home-built phase fluorometer described here and uh, using this cross-correlation principle, which became very important, as we'll mention again. But in this paper, they measured the lifetime of NADH as 0.38, which is basically what we see today. And here's a picture of him in the lab in, in the early, late 60s, Richard Spencer, the, the postdoc who, well, he was a student then who did this for a PhD thesis, and Gregorio Weber. And um, in the final chapter of his thesis is devoted to application of polarization measurements to determine viscosity of gels. So he actually wrote his final paragraph, polarization method appears very convenient for determination of viscosity of protoplasm. Both the micro and macro viscosity are of importance. And he, he told me how he first was thinking of this because he was looking at, at gels and he would take a gel where you could bounce it in your hand, this gel with fluorescein and the polarization was near zero was suggested to him that the fluorescein was in a pocket between the gel matrix spinning around, whereas rhodamine, um, it would be very high, the polarization, because it bound to the, the proteins. So this gave him the concept of micro and macro viscosity. Actually, in his thesis work, I mean, his medical thesis work he did with um, a fibrinogen with Bernardo Husse, he even talked about some of these differences. And this prescient observation anticipated the work he published 24 years later, which first delineated the application of fluorescent probes to study lipid systems. And that was this paper. It had two papers with Shaninsky and others in the lab, and they used Perlin to study micelles and membrane systems. And they look at the polarization change. And this inspired Shaninsky when he got back a few years later in Israel to develop diphenylhexatriene, which for decades was the membrane probe that people utilize. And now it's starting to be supplanted by Lordan. Okay, but this was the this was the probe for decades and decades. And now, as we all know, especially from this workshop, these type of probes and model and membrane systems are very important. And here's an example of, of uh, looking at GUVs. Again, this was early stuff I got from Louise Begatoli. Well, in 48 to 52, he carried out independent investigations in Cambridge, and he looked more deeply in the theory of polarization, developed methods that allow him to study proteins, which did not contain an intrinsic fluorophore because tryptophan had not yet been discovered, which was discovered later by Gregorio Weber. And he invested a lot of time and effort. He said more than two years to develop a probe that could be covalently attached to proteins, but also possess the absorption and emission characteristics that could be used with the instrument, instrumentation available in post-war England. And after two years of effort, he came up with the Dazzle chloride probe, which is still used widely today. Now his 52 papers with the new instrumentation began to use it to publish the theory and experimental results. And he published this paper, which is quoted enormous number of times on the theory paper, and I wanted to point out what he's doing is extending Perrin's work to, to oblate and prolate to, to different shaped ellipsoids with the probe randomly oriented. And it was a real mathematical tour de force. It's not like, oh, here's the polarization equation, the Perrin. That's it. So I just want to flip through the pages, give you an idea of how complicated these, these early works were. And he was just amazingly uh, adept at mathematics. That was sort of a hobby of his. So it's wonderful for those of you with a mathematical interest to look at these, at this early paper. And interestingly, at the end, he, thanked, he thanks Francis Perrin 
for suggestions. And unfortunately, I never thought to ask him what were the suggestions of Peren, but I wish I had, but I didn't. So he continued over the years to advance the theory. And he had other papers on this. And finally, this paper with uh, Belford and Belford, a mathematician of physical chemistry at Illinois, where they examined previous treatments by several groups. And they presented now what's now generally accepted as the time dependence of fluorescence polarization due to rotation of the fusion on rigid macromolecules. So these are the final equation everybody accepts. Now, in 53, Hans Krebs recruited Weber at the new biochemistry department at Sheffield. And Krebs, as you may recall, won the Nobel Prize in 1953 for elucidation of the tricarboxylic acid cycle, or now we call it the Krebs cycle. During his years at Sheffield, Weber continued to lay the foundations of modern fluorescence, developing both fluorescence theory and instrumentation. And here he is at the dinner celebrating Krebs's Nobel Prize. There's Weber, and on the left, there's, there's Krebs in 53. So those were certainly great times to be in, uh, in, in Sheffield. Now, his pioneering contributions during these early years included his report with Lawrence in 54, of the fluorescence properties of analyl and ethylene sulfonate. And this was the first demonstration of a dye that in water was virtually non-fluorescent, but bound to a protein away from the water got brightly fluorescent. And I think Lena was gonna do a demonstration. Is that correct? Are you there, Lena? I am here. Okay. So let me mark a little bit of the room. Yes, you need this in a dark room. Because it's a wonderful demonstration to show your students. You need it a little darker, I think. Can, can you stop your, your, your screen? Your okay. share screen? Is that okay? Of course. Okay. Can you zoom in here, Marcela? Um, um... Are you Have watching your... now at the... Yes, we see it. You have ANS, I presume. Exactly. So what we have here is ANS in water. As you can see, there is a yellowish fluorescent, but very, very belly fluorescence. And what I have here is a, a seroalbumin, bovine seroalbumin. So look what happened. Yes. Spectacular. That's where the audience should go ooh and ah. But uh, yeah. so, so that demonstration goes back in 1954 to Gregorio Weber, and we still do it today. It's magnificent. I remember when Gregorio Weber showed me this; it was amazing. So, any rate, okay. I'll go back to my screen. Okay, but. You know, it's something you can easily demonstrate to your students uh, sometime. It really is dramatic. And um, even today, um, oh, let's see, I'm not going forward. Okay, S more than 60 years later, 70 almost now, ANS is still being used in protein studies as an indicator of the molten globular state of proteins when you're where you have a condensation of hydrophobic residues, but it's uh, still used today. But what about intrinsic protein fluorescence? During the years at Sheffield, uh, Gregorio Weber and his postdoctoral student, John Teal, became their, began their studies on the fluorescence of aromatic amino acids. This had not been done before. And they published a series of important papers describing the excitation and fluorescence spectrum of aromatic amino acids, tyrosine, tryptophan, phenylalanine, and that was in this paper, um, published, I think, in 57. Now, figure seven from this paper is reproduced many, many, many times in review articles and books. So this is what he had in here, the excitation spectrum of phenylalanine, tryptophan, tyrosine, and then the spectrum showing the fluorescence, not to scale, but of showing where they emit a phenylalanine, tryptophan, tyrosine. And this figure has been used, reproduced hundreds of times. And I'm very happy to report I had a hand in making something, a, a report of it that Gregory Weber we're very pleased with. So I've been involved for a while with NASA 
on their Europa project where they're sending up probes to Europa, eventually the plan to land and get look in the ice looking for life detection and other other properties. But since one of the things was to look for tryptophan, I managed to get in their official document, this original figure of Gregorio Weber, which I think would really please Gregorio Weber that his uh, observations may be involved in looking for life on Europa, one of the moons of uh, Jupiter. And uh, why am I not going forward? There we are. So let's continue. Well, besides the ANS and the Dazzle, he made BIS-ANS, which is an important probe for nucleotide binding proteins. He made IEDANS, which is the first probe synthesized specifically to attach to cysteine residues. And you've heard about some work even here with cysteine reactive probes, and he, this was the first one. He made pyrobutyric acid, the first probe with a very long lifetime of one or 200 nanoseconds. We're looking at the time with very large proteins and you that rotate slow, do you need a long lifetime? And of course he made the famous Lordan Prodan Danka. I should say, you probably all wondering what the devil was Danka for, right? Well, he made that specifically so that this would, because of the substituents on the, on the groups, the hexanoic acid, would bind to heme protein and it used this to study the heme pocket of myoglobin. Okay, so that was one of the first uses of, the, of those type of probes was DACA actually. And here you see the famous picture of minus 80 of, of uh, Lornan or Prodan looks identical in glycerin and then at plus 60, the huge shift. And these were made as, as uh, Leonel said by Faye Ferris, his technician in Weber, and this was the lab, and it was a frightening lab to walk into as a student, because look at this, what a mess. But all these probes came out of this laboratory, and Faye Ferris, his technician, had no training in chemistry, but he had met her and talked to her, and she was an excellent cook. And he wanted somebody who could follow his directions, because basically to be his eyes and his hands, because already his eyesight was very poor from all the UV and infrared exposure he obtained. So she was, he was the, she was his eyes and hands following his instruction and made all these probes that you hear about. What about phase fluorometry? During the 50s, he started to think about a fluorescence lifetime instrument, no doubt influenced by the work of Enrique Gaviola and fellow Argentinian. And he worked on designing a phase fluorometer. Now at that time, Burks and others had built several types of phase fluorometers, but in Illinois with Richard Spencer, they developed the first versatile phase and modulation thing using the principles of cross correlation. I won't go into details, but basically, this was the approach to modern phase fluorometry. And all of people using this use cross correlation principles now. Um, so, when Enrico Gratone joined Weber's lab in the mid 70s, and here you see a wonderful picture of Gregory Weber walking across the, uh, the mall, as it's called, at University of Illinois campus with Enrico. Uh, Weber suggested that he worked on developing a phase and modulation fluorometer with continuously variable light modulation frequencies. So it was at Weber's suggestion, and Rico did this when he returned 78 assistant professor. He had already finished his first multi frequency instrument using a Paco cell, so you could pick any frequency you want, thus completing Weber's vision. So we look at a timeline of development. We see Gaviola's work. Then in 69, Gregorio Weber, where he used what's called a Debye Sears tank to modulate the light. Then Enrico's work in 83, and now 90s, and now you have many, many types of uh, fluorescent uh, lifetime imaging microscopes. And I mentioned this important paper before by Weber, where he basically was deriving the equations to analyze if you have n components and you have phase and modulation at n frequencies, you can analytically extract the, the methods. But in this process, uh, he developed, well, before I do that, I should say that, you know, so I say, why is this not widely used? Well, Enrico and I looked at this very carefully, and it turns out when you get to two components, you need about plus or minus 50 or 100 picosecond. Three components, you need five picoseconds, and more components, even better. 
So that's why we developed this fitting of the nonlinear least squares method, which is much easier to do. It didn't need the precision that Weber's pure mathematically pure analytical solution took. But important for us, that's where he first described these equations which form the basis of, of the phasers. And we've talked a lot about the phaser equations and how it's transformative because we can map back and forth now. Okay, he got many awards. Um, many of you that go to biophysics know that we have a national, national lecture each year in biophysics, a prominent biophysicist. Well, Weber was the first national lecturer when they first started this, of course. And he got many other things, National Academy of Sciences. The Rumford Premium, I'll come back to, because he said that was his favorite. And uh, okay, the Rumford Premium is the oldest scientific prize in the US, recognizes contributions to the field of heat and light. And it was set up by a bequest from Benjamin Thompson, Count Rumford in 1796. And Weber said he liked it because so here he's getting it along with Mills and Yang who did the gauge theories and gravity and Yang's got a Nobel prize for that work. And um, previous winners of this award includes J. Willard Gibbs, Edison, Wood, Michelson, Bridgman, Land, Fermi, Onsinger, Chandra Sekhar, Town. So Weber thought it was good company to be included within. I, I think so. And also when the American Chemical Society first started an award, the Replicant Award for Chemistry of Biological Processes, again, they gave the first one to Gregoria Weber in 86. And this is not to do with fluorescence so much as his work on protein chemistry. And I can't go into that now, but I have an entire Gregory Weber lecture about his contributions to protein fluorescence, which were immense, but that's another story. Symposium honored Gregory Weber. We had the first Weber symposia in 1986 in Boca de Magra. And if you look around, there's Gregory Weber, there's Enrico Guitton, there I am. And a lot of people, very prominent fluorescence people are in this picture, but there's no time to, to pick that apart. And then we had a series of others. We had Frascati in 91 in Italy, and then we had a series in two in Maui. And after that in Kauai, finally moving to Buzio. So here's the Kauai one. And I'd like to show this. This is some of the people at the meeting. We didn't get everybody to come to the pool, but here, of course, is me. And here's Luis Bagatoli. So certainly he was there and not only uh, gave wonderful talks, but he entertained us all with his guitar playing, and he was really a true expert at that. Now, Buzios in 2017, we had the last Weber meeting, and I wanted to point out that these Weber meetings are known for their total focus on rigorous science, all right? And here's Enrico demonstrating fluctuations uh, to us in real time, and now at the last meeting of Buzios, Enrico actually gave a hands-on course on diffusion and particle tracking it. Believe me, it was very hard to track him around this room, but we tried. But that's another story. Now, the next Weber meeting is coming up in Uruguay in January uh, 2023. So hopefully, I know some of you will be there. And some of you that might want to, if you're there in Uruguay, drive up and drop in for a day. We'll all be there. Many of us will be there. You can ask Leonel about more details of this symposia. So we're all looking forward to that. Now, you can read more about Gregorio Weber on the Laboratory for Lawrence's Dynamic webpage. There's a lot of sites there. There's this book, which has a wonderful series of articles by people that worked with Weber, like Pancho Barantes wrote a wonderful one about Weber's growing up in Argentina and, and all of that, and they have many other nice things. And uh, I have a PDF of this, and if anybody really wants to see this, I'm happy to send you the PDF. And the publisher probably doesn't like this, but they're charging something like $300 for this book, which is ridiculous because who can afford to buy it? But if you want us that book, I'd be happy to send you. In fact, I should send it to you, Leon. Leon, I don't know if you have a copy, but we'll make sure you do for the students. And uh, so again, there's more details on the, uh, on the site. And I have on my trivial little web page, some more things about Gregorio Weber. And but here's an interesting site done by uh, David Lloyd, who was a, um, an undergraduate with Weber, believe it or not, in Sheffield. 
And he gave us a talk once at a Weber meeting about his time there, but he got together a lot of the people from the old days that were there with Weber back in the old days. And they're wonderful to read these things. And I just wanted to read one about Fred Sanger, who hopefully most of you know, got a Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1958 for elucidating sequencing of a protein for the first time, and in 1980 for his work on sequencing DNA. And he said this, I do not feel able to comment on Gregorio's published work as it was rather different fields of my own, but I do believe his contribution to science was considerably more than appeared in print. During the time that we were both working in the Cambridge Biochemical Laboratory, he would frequently come over to my bench to see what I was doing, discuss my work, and make useful suggestions. I found this stimulating and awful helpful for my work. Gregorio had a considerable wider knowledge of science than I did and was a wonderful person. So it's interesting to see what somebody like Fred Sanger thought of Gregorio Weber. And finally, some of you have seen this, but I don't care. I love telling this story so much. This is Final Observations. This is based on an actual conversation I had with Gregorio Weber in Hawaii. As you can see, it was a few years ago. I was much younger, and there's Gregorio Weber, and we're in Hawaii. And Weber said this to me. Oh, let's get this. You know, David, when I was much younger, an older colleague said to me, Gregorio, when you pass the age of 60, you begin to notice that your students have more ideas than you and better ideas than you. And I pondered that and I said, gee, really, Professor? And I remember he took a very long time as he looked at me before he answered, looking at me. I have not found this to be the case. So, okay, but it, this was a real conversation. And then I thought to myself, well, since Enrico and I have gotten so old now, what would happen if, if Enrico had been there? And he said, how about you, Enrico? And I imagine what Enrico might say. I think he'd say in their dreams. And he might even go and say, to me, David, what about you? And I'd probably say, huh? Okay, but that's that's another story. But I'm, I'm letting you know, Leonel, at some point you'll reach that age and then you can <laughs> be added to this uh, conversation. So uh, that's pretty much all I want to say. So I hope I brought you up to date a little bit on how our field developed and a little better appreciation for the monumental contributions of Gregorio Weber to our field. So thank you for your attention. And now, you can finally relax.